Tony Axelson is a lecturer uh, at our department, but he has also worked for many years uh, in the museum context. Uh, and he has been running a project especially um, with this problematic in mind. Uh, so in a way, uh, he's reporting some of the results from from, from that kind of uh, practical based uh, research on communicating archaeology. So, that's Tony. Thank you. Um, do you hear me back there? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, as Christian said, I have a background uh, working at one of the regional museums here in, in West Sweden for many years. And uh, now I'm a lecturer and also the director of our Heritage uh, Studies Bachelor Program at the Historical Studies Department. And uh, I've been doing research on uh, Neolithic remains, megaliths, but also on uh, heritage and even zoos. Uh, but today I will talk about a small project that we ran in uh, Skara in Västergötland uh, some years ago. And um, I will not be too theoretical today because I know that all of you are well familiar with with the heritage and, and working with the public, perhaps. But I'm, I'm going to try to deliver some um, practical insights that we gained from our project. And uh, perhaps we will we'll end with uh, discussing this. But first, I would like to do what many archaeologists do, show you some pictures from my summer holiday. And uh, I'm going to take you to Beirut in Lebanon, just to remind us how difficult heritage can be, or could be, and how heritage always is um, entangled with politics and so on. What you have here is the statue in the Martyr Square in central Beirut. It's in the middle of the green zone, uh, the, the green zone that they, um, during the, that was in the middle of the two sides in the Civil War. And uh, what you see here laying down is uh, a symbol of the Lebanese people being freed from the Ottoman Empire in 1918. And a terrible execution of more than 100 people that were opposing the, the, uh, the Turkish regime. Standing is freedom, holding her hand around the symbol of Lebanon. And in the close-up you can see here how they actually literally destroyed Lebanon during the Civil War. Snipers were shooting at it. Uh, when talking about involving the public uh, in Sweden, it's quite easy and it's not that much conflict, not so that, as in this example, but um, in, involving them uh, could be difficult. This is the place where all demonstrations end up. If you want to protest against the regime, you go to the Martyr Square. It's also the square that the military closed down as soon as they sense that there are some difficulties coming up. So controlling Martyr Square and therefore also controlling or owning the history uh, is always about politics. When talking about heritage and archaeology, as a professional, sometimes I tend to be have a certain gaze or, or so. I was walking around in Beirut documenting buildings like this. This is the Holiday Inn. You that uh, lived during the 70s and saw the rep uh, TV reports from, from the war uh, have seen this building many times. Here has every militia leader has stu stood in front of this building declaring some kind of victory. Yasser Arafat has been here and all of them. Uh, today, it's a ruin, uh, but is it heritage? Should we preserve it? Well, actually, in, in Beirut today, there are some people that say that they should preserve the old buildings. Uh, yes, this one is owned by the Emir of Kuwait, and uh, <coughs> we don't want to do anything uh, with it because he was very disappointed. It was finished in 1974, and in 1975, the war broke out. Uh, so it's going to be there for a while. Today, it's uh, controlled by the Lebanese military. And uh, this is a constant reminder of how difficult it's been in, in Beirut. 
the example I'm going to talk about today is not that difficult. Uh, but uh, as a foreigner coming to Lebanon and start talking about preserving these buildings, it's kind of difficult. And we must remember that when we involve people, that there are always different agendas and different attitudes. So, from uh, the Middle East, we moved to central west Sweden, Varnhem. Uh, this is a small village that, has an, uh, that is famous for its uh, monastery church and the ruins of the Sister Sciencian Monastery that were demolished by the Swedish King Gustav Vasa in the 1500s. Um, the museum I worked with is situated quite close, and uh, we got an invitation to start a project. And how this started is quite odd, actually, because um, the background is that the Swedish author Jan Gio wrote three novels about a knight templar called Arne, his fictions. But all the places that he uses in the book are real. He mentions Barnhem, he mentions other churches and other monasteries. And um, this led to, no one expected this, but it led to that uh, many people, the tourists, started to travel around in the landscape, trying to follow in the footsteps of Arn. And, uh, as you can see, here is the increase of the number of visitors. And, but then in 2003, 2002, 2003, uh, a decline started. And then the organizations uh, involved in tourism uh, started to think about what can we do, what should we do, uh, because tourists are, of course, a good thing. Uh, working at the museum today in Sweden, I suspect it's the same in, in your countries, uh, tourism is very important. We are in a context where we actually are a part of making money for society. Uh, There's some figures for Swedish context. And almost 37% of the tourism is in Sweden is related to culture. So um, for a place like Varnhem or central west Sweden, tourism is important. Um, in Sweden, the situation is like this, 167,000 people work with tourism, and uh, that is as many as uh, the 11, 12 biggest Swedish companies. So it's a huge sector. And uh, of course, they were concerned when they saw this decline. They were very happy when uh, uh, the people start coming, but then the, when they were not interested anymore, they were a bit worried. Uh, just an anecdote, and unfortunately this is in Swedish, but uh, talking about tourism is not new. This is from a paper in, from 1934, and they discussed the same things that we discussed today. Uh, packages with hotel, the train travel, and look at some ancient monuments. So nothing is really new, but um, um, it's more and more important for us. So what happened was that the organizations working in this region, uh, they turned to the museum with one simple question. Can you do something about real, the real medieval period, the authentic medieval period? And um, it's always difficult to, to decide what's authentic or not. But what we did was that we constructed a research and communication project looking at the period where we leave the Viking Age and go over into medieval times, where, where the first Christians appear in the landscape. And um, uh, it's not a very big project. We had about 250,000 euros. So it's very big for a museum. And um, we early, or I early decided that we should also involve in this project um, an aim to communicate the results with the public. So what I did was that I split the budget. We put half of the money on excavations and science and half of the money on communication. We uh, 
tried to write uh, easily understood small brochures and pass them around. I'm not letting you see them anymore, so I'm not promoting them. But um, we made a film with a professional uh, company that cost us about 50,000 euros. Uh, and the rest uh, of the communication part, we put on actually being out there talking to people. And that's what I'm going to try to describe today, our model of how this can be done. <clears throat> so, uh, the excavations were divided over several different periods, but in total we, we were in, out in, in the field for 20 weeks. And we had 20,000 visitors. And that's quite a lot. The museum that I worked with, we had 39,000 a year. So it was a huge success in that way. And why was that? Well, of course, uh, in the region there are a huge interest in history. Is, it is a popular interest uh, in the local history. Um, the film of the Knight Templar and the books uh, and all the people traveling the footsteps of Arne, uh, of course, they were in the landscape and they took a chance to come and visit us. Uh, the excavation of, of the site uh, was a medieval church with a churchyard and skeletons is always uh, attracting people. It is exciting. But the key to all the visitors, I believe, is our way of doing public archaeology. And uh, quite early, this I, I decided that we should be open as much as possible. And of course we organized daily tours that's been done since archaeology started, if not daily, so once a while during the excavations. But every day at two o'clock, no matter how few people or no matter to the weather, we were there to, to guide them. Monday to Friday, I should say, on, on weekends we were, we were off. But we also took it one step further. We allowed the people to come as close as possible, as long as they couldn't hurt themselves. They were allowed to walk everywhere. Uh, they are standing on the 10th century <coughs> walls. And um, in 15 years ago, that would have been impossible. But I know that when we are restoring this, we have to take down at least one, two, maybe three stones because frost has been going down and they are cracked and so forth. But for them, standing on that and telling them, do you actually know that you are the first person in 1,000 years that sees this or stands on it? It's a, um, uh, quite a sensation. We also let them down on the churchyard. Here are the archaeologists working. Here are the skeletons. They could walk right among us. They could ask questions. And uh, nothing was destroyed. They were minding where they put their feet. And, uh, but of course, that took a lot of energy from the archaeologists. Uh, and uh, you were not allowed on the project if you didn't like this. You, you had to like um, people. And uh, we had uh, made the joke, but we said it's going to feel like coming to McDonald's. Hello, welcome, nice to see you, instead of seeing them as a problem. And then we tried to shift people around so not everyone met the visitors all the time. Uh, sometimes you could excavate a bit further back in the area. Um, we also worked a lot on accessibility, to be open, to be clear. We had an information tent that was open all week, all year, uh, where we posted the latest results, uh, where they could uh, uh, see a small exhibition. And, um, that was, uh, and also very clear, I mean, pe when people come to a site, they're a bit anxious, where can I walk, where can I don't walk, but we put up signs and were very clear about what was going on. We also tried to work with schools on all levels. Um, the hardest part with this project was that actually on the small hill where the church and the churchyard were situated. Uh, 
those four-year-old kids had, had their camp school. One day every week, they went up there and uh, cooked outside and did things. And you know, we couldn't understand what was this kind of wood and sticks and stuff standing up against the, the, the trees. We just took it away. So we kind of destroyed their playground. But instead, they came out and started talking to us. And uh, I will get back to this a bit later. But uh, here we have people that are in 17, 18 years old. It's easy to talk to them. They are standing here, four years old, actually looking at the four-year-old kid lying here. And I was terrified the first time I was going to talk to them about that. But that was quite actually natural and easy. Yeah. So we tried to include everyone that was interested in, in our project. But also, we work very intentionally with our narratives. Uh, I decided that we should not talk like an archaeologist. No one is interested in a carbon-14 dating, if it's plus minus 40 years or not. Uh, using words like likely, probably, no, we don't do that. We tell one story, but we change it every time we have to. And for some people, they came, they stayed for half an hour, and that was fine. They got one story. Others were very provoked by us saying, how can you know that? Are you sure? And then you could start a dialogue with them, talking about the process of archaeology. And actually, but if you start talking about probabilities, you will lose some people on the, on the way. Uh, and I should give you an example, not from this site, but from another site, where a colleague of mine is laying and excavating on a churchyard. She has a nine-year-old kid with her, and that's also a public archaeology project. And he finds a tooth. That day, the osteologist is not at the site. So he goes to Katharina and he asks her, is this a human tooth? And she starts talking like an archaeologist. Well, you know, I'm not the osteologist. I don't know. Human teeth can look like pig teeth. And the kid is quiet for a minute, and then he says, ah, did they bury pigs at this churchyard? And I mean, of course, it's obvious. Of course, it's humans. And, and so we don't need to be so anxious. Uh, but maybe when we are with colleagues, we should be anxious. And, and so. um, but the narratives is also includes talking about how did the people in Barnham live? How tall were they? What diseases did they have? Um, but we also, at this churchyard, we had um, evidence of what's uh, documented in old, old Norwegian sagas about how the burial ground to a church like this were organized with the owners closest to the church, and then there was the farmers, the free given slaves, and furthest away were the slaves. So we could talk about that and try to connect that to, um, to uh, modern society. How many slaves are there in the world today? Do you know? The UN says 30 million. Human rights organization says 100 million. And all of a sudden, the archaeological material becomes relevant uh, for us. Um, we also try to, to work with the skeletons, uh, telling them, well, this is how you see that it's a man. You can see it up here. Uh, he probably died from the infection he got from the broken tooth here that dissolved the uh, jawbone. And um, they didn't have penicillin. Every time during that time, that every time that you had penicillin, uh, you would probably have died during the medieval period. How far do you have to travel today to not have medical stuff? But also, we let them um, look at the material close by. Uh, or uh, we could talk to them about, we have a lot of women uh, buried with children on their chest. They probably died giving birth. Today there are more women killed giving birth than there are people dying from cancer. So we try to work with both the prehistoric and medieval material, but also bring it up to us. Um, child mortality, for example, three out of four kids didn't reach the age of seven. Um, 
in Bornheim. Today, how far do you have to go to find those rays in, in the world, and so on. So that was quite important to talk about, um, have the good narratives, but also base them on a scientific uh, manner. But then, of course, um, there are problems. Uh, with exposing uh, skeletons. There are a lot of ethical questions in Sweden today. Uh, all museum officials are very anxious about this. What should we do with them? Should we rebury them? Can we show them? Can you pass it around like I do here? Um, and um, that was also one thing that we were able to discuss with the public. And you could meet all kinds of attitudes toward this. Some people from the local community, the churchgoers, they talked about reburying them. Uh, they asked a lot, what do you do with them? Well, what we do with them is that we put them in a cardboard box and we put them in the museum uh, store, storage. Um, and uh, I had one mother in her 50s coming with her daughter, 14 year old. And the mother, she took one standpoint. She said, well, that would be difficult. What happens on the last day when you're supposed to, um, what do you call that in English? Uh, research, no, oh, well, um, on the, well, she was at least Christian, and she, she believed she was going to heaven sometime. And what happens if I'm in a cardboard box in the museum? And that was her big problem. And the 14-year-old was standing there, chewing on her gum. It's cool, mom. God will fix that. And, and that's also, because when we are to involve the public, we say the public, but there are so many. And they are of all age. And all, um, well, in this case, it was mo mostly Swedish people, but there could also be people from other countries. I had one showing out there when I was talking about the skeletons, and I saw that the group looked a bit reserved. Well, there were people... Um, they were people coming from another country. They have fled the war. They have seen dead people laying on the, alongside the roads. For them, skeletons was no fun at all. And that's also a thing when we start talking about, and maybe even using words like Swedish heritage or Swedish medieval period, that when we try to expose it to people, we also uh, evoke things that they have with them, so uh, and in order not to exclude them, you have to be aware of those things. We also um, decided that uh, we should be very clear with what we were doing there, who we were. So instead of looking like uh, road workers, where we usually do when we are excavating, you know, with the clothes, with all the yellow clothes, with, with um, reflective material, we decided that we should look scientific. And scientific is the khaki colored clothes. They're crappy to excavate in because you have no knee padding and everything. But actually, it, the public commented on this. They thought we looked professional and they could see who was the archaeologist and who was not. Um, authenticity was very important to us. We, um, even if we just told one story and didn't use the words likely and probable, uh, or probably, um, we, when we invited schools to participate in the dig, we let them actually excavate in the middle of the churchyard. When we were excavating, we removed with the machine, of course, maybe 20, 30 meters of soil. We took away 10 centimeters for them, but the, the really, interested ones, they actually got down to the interesting layers, but that was very important to, if you're going to let them play archaeologists, that it is for real. It needs to be authentic. And um, I think when, and that's one of the strong <coughs> parts of doing public archaeology out in the landscape, that it is authentic and it is for real. Uh, you have not moved it from its context and you can see it Side. Uh, 
media. A lot of people are not able to come to the site. Uh, they have not the um, possibility or maybe they don't want to wait for the publications to come, which sometimes can take many years. Uh, so media is important and they could of course be quite annoying, but we decided early on that we were, we were going to be as open towards them as we were towards the public. So when the journalists came, we always allocated time to talk to them. We offered to um, read their text if they wanted to. And uh, by doing that, the process with media was quite simple because they got their time and it got right in the paper. Um, but you need to talk slow with them and not use the too difficult words and maybe say the same thing twice or three times. So um, working with openness, accessibility, authenticity and the good narratives uh, were very important for us. Uh, also, of course, the excavation was free. I mean, you could visit it. It was no charge of coming there. Uh, but then, as I started with, we got the money from this foundation. And they didn't care what we did, and we didn't have to do this. But as during the second uh, year of the project, they realized that uh, we were attracting a lot of visitors and they started asking us questions about who is coming and who are the visitors and so on. So we started to also include uh, some, um, we, we, we tried to ask the visitors and, and do some statistics on who is visiting and, and where are they from and so on. And um, one of the results that was quite uh, amazing was that it was more men visiting us. You see in visitors in Sweden, the typical museum visitor in Sweden is a female in her 50s. Um, and uh, so in the museum, this chart looks the opposite. But out there, we attracted more men. I don't know why, uh, but that was happened. Um, we also did a, some statistics on where are the visitors from. and. Uh, talking to tourist people uh, and developers in the region, they <coughs> tend to focus on the Germans or the French or non-Nordic uh, visitors. But as you can see here, uh, the vast majority are from the nearby or the local region. This is to... Uh, they are the one that cares about this. And of course, they, it's closer for them to travel and it's easier and so on. Uh, but putting a lot of money on 1% from the rest of Europe, or should you put your money here on the people actually living there, caring about this heritage? Um, but of course, they don't spend nights at hotels. They maybe have their coffee basket with them, so they won't generate that much. But in the long run, when it comes to taking care of our heritage and, and uh, spreading the knowledge, I think that this group, the local group, is the important one. Uh, mostly adults in the summertime, the few sorry kids that have to follow the parents to the site. And here is when the school started, startups, and then it's one third is kids visiting us. We have also and this is where I come to what, what public archaeology could be. We are also, this is in Swedish, but I will translate. Um, we had a book in the tent where people could write comments um, and so on. And what we see is that what they say about the excavation is exciting, interesting, interesting, uh, something about, that I can't translate, but something about history. Uh, and exciting again. Um, the uh, younger the kids, they say uh, awesome or cool or wicked, something like that. But that's the same thing. Uh, that's a common comment that we get. We also uh, 
could see that people were visiting us several times. And that made it possible to, with some people, have a dialogue. Because they could actually say, what well, last week you said. Yeah, but now it's like this, because, and so on. Uh, so watching the process of archaeology seemed to be important uh, for some people. We had to go here again. Third time in a month. And also the uh, uh, image of the archaeologist that is out or she uh, on a quest. Hope you find what you're looking for. That we have a goal with what we're doing and it's a mystery that we are supposed to solve. Uh, there is one that I think it's incredible that we could learn so much about how it was in the medieval period by just looking at some stones and skeletons. The archaeologist as an expert. And um, that's what I think is the key of archaeology and public archaeology, uh, or the attraction of it, that people find archaeology exciting or cool and wicked. Uh, they see the archaeology as an expert. They want to learn from us. And we should be the expert and take that role. Uh, but it's also a form of entertainment. They are spectators sometimes. Some of them want to be engaged. Some of them want to participate. But some of them is just happy with looking at us, doing what we do. And perhaps it is an escape uh, from everyday life for some people. They, they uh, see it as a holiday or, or so, and they go here and they look at something exo exotic. Um, I also believe that archaeology answers to a public demand of consuming history. Um, I think that the public has a need uh, for uh, excitement, and there are also a desire to, to discover things. This man is quite remarkable. He, he came up one day and then started talking to me and he was doing like this. And I didn't realize, but he actually took a picture and made his own t-shirt of one of the graves. He's not trying to sell it, it's just for himself, but that's how engaged he, he got. And um, um, we met quite a few of those people. That, came back and that they are emailing us uh, asking still about the results and so on. Um, so um, the asset is the working archaeologist, the expert uh, following the process. People could stand for hours looking at an archaeologist brushing a skeleton, maybe coming back next day. And um, that's, um, that's, and that became the starting point, I should say, for the rest of our other projects that we have done after that, where we have also included uh, the locals in participating in, in the excavations and, and so on. And they are becoming helpers to us. Uh, but the strength is the working archaeologist and the expert. Thank you.